All right, I'm seeing a thumbs up. Does that thumbs up mean I should proceed? We good to go? We're good to go. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jeremy Brown. I am the chair of the history department here at Simon Fraser University. And I'm so delighted to welcome you here to the second lecture in our series highlighting black histories featuring Dr. Deborah Thompson from McGill University here in person on campus in Vancouver and also streaming on Zoom. Let me pause for a minute to make sure our folks on Zoom can hear. Everything's smooth, everything's good on Zoom. So let me then respectfully acknowledge that those of us here in the lecture here, lecture hall are gathered on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil -Waututh peoples. And we in the history department, we are actively working to name and dismantle the colonial structures that have shaped us since our founding in 1965 at Luk Lahai Huaiten, which is a Squamish place name for the base of Burnaby Mountain. And so whether you're here in the lecture hall, whether you're joining us on Zoom, I encourage you to learn more about the past and the present and the future of the indigenous territory that you're situated on wherever you are. And one way to do that is to think about borders. Dr. Thompson is gonna to touch on the US-Canada border tonight. Uh, and that border is very close to us. Sometimes it's blockaded. Uh, and aside from that, it's a border that's not a natural border. It's not an inevitable border. It's, it's not a normal border. In fact, it's crossed and divided and caused harm to multiple indigenous nations and it's excluded racialized individuals as well. And one thing I've been learning about in relation to the history of this border is the Oregon Treaty of 1846. If you don't know about that, if you haven't heard about it, I urge you to look it up. You can Wikipedia, look at, look at it on Wikipedia right now. Uh, you can learn about it, remind yourself about it if you forgot about it. Um, and I wanna thank two people for, thank, for teaching me about that board, the uh, Oregon Treaty of 1846. One is Zaina Khan, who's an undergraduate in history at SFU and who is assisting our department in decolonizing uh, right now. The other is Maggie Ka Ing Tsang, who's a PhD candidate in health sciences at SFU, who urged me to read a report by the Challenging Racist British Columbia Project. And this report is called 150 Years and Counting. It's a project affiliated with UVic, uh, including many researchers from all over British Columbia. So I urge you to check out this report at challengingracistbc.ca. Um, it's really worth a read if you wanna learn more about this. So our lecture series this year is called Highlighting Black Histories, and it aims to highlight multiple varied diverse black histories. And choosing to highlight black histories means that we as a history department are actively saying this topic is extremely important. So I wanna be very transparent and intentional about this. Highlighting black histories means this is a topic we've chosen because it's of great importance to us uh, and to the community. And so black histories, plural histories, are important to learn about and to learn from in February. Of course, we wanna do this in February, but also in October when we had our first lecture and in April, when we're gonna have our next lecture in the series, we encourage all of you to come in every other month of the year, every other year from now on. Uh, so let me now thank Jonathan Goodluckson, who's at the back of the room, give us a wave, Jonathan. Uh, and Jonathan has been key in coordinating and organizing this event, along with Dr. Badisha Ray, who's gonna be coordinating things on Zoom. Uh, I wanna thank James Haldane, who's in charge of the tech, that's gonna make this hybrid event go smoothly. Rebecca Armstrong helped to arrange travel for our guest. Uh, we've got a couple of students who help check you in. You're gonna see them running around and helping with the logistics. They're, they're Justin DeVries and Ismail Melian. We appreciate them. Uh, Dr. Ray and Dr. Tomas Kewen dreamed up this event in the first place. And our dream is now a reality. And so with that, let me turn over the podium to Dr. Kewen. Tomas Kewen is gonna come, uh, come up to introduce our speaker. speaker. So thanks so much. Dear guests, here at SFU's uh, Vancouver campus and on Zoom. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Kuhn. I teach Ottoman and modern Middle East history uh, here at Simon Fraser University. And it is a great honor and real, real pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Deborah Thompson, who is going to speak about homecoming, blackness and belonging across the Canada-US border. Educated at Carleton University and the University of Toronto, where she received her PhD in 2010, 
Dr. Thompson is an associate professor in McGill University's Department of Political Science, where she holds a tier two Canada Research Chair in Racial Inequality uh, in Democratic Societies. Uh, she has previously taught at Ohio University, Northwestern University, and the University of Oregon. In 2010 and 2011, uh, she was also a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University's Department of Government. Professor Thompson is widely recognized as a leading scholar of the comparative politics of race. Her teaching and research uh, interests focus on the relationship among race, the state, and inequality in democratic societies. Her first book, The Schematic State, Race, Transnationalism, and the Politics of the Census, that was published by Cambridge University Press in uh, 2016, is a comparative landmark study of governmentality uh, that focuses on the political development of racial classifications on the national censuses of the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. The Schematic State has received three major awards from the P American Political Science Association and Dr. Thompson's 2008 article, Is Race Political?, won the Canadian Political Science Association's John McNamee Prize for the best article published in the Canadian Journal of Political Science. Professor Thompson's work has appeared in journals such as the Canadian Journal of Political Science, Ethnic, um, uh, Ethnic and Racial Studies, Social and Legal Studies, and the Cambridge Review of International Affairs. She's currently working on two book projects, uh, the first of which, titled The Long Road Home on Blackness and Belonging, is scheduled to be published by Simon & Schuster in September of 2022, so very soon. Professors, Professor Thompson's monograph and articles are must-reads for anyone who wants a deeper critical understanding of the politics of race exclusion in contemporary North America and beyond. We are honored to host a scholar who has done such critical, innovative work on these important subjects. Let me remind you that we will have about 30 minutes of our question, for questions uh, following Dr. Thompson's talk. Let please join me in welcoming Dr. Deborah Thompson. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Good evening. Any other month of the year, I might let you get away with that, but this is Black History Month, and black history and black culture means that during this talk, you get to laugh and clap and snap and holler and boo if you want, and when I say good evening, you respond with good evening. So let's try it again. Good evening. Well done, well done. Thank you all for having me here. It's such a pleasure to be here in person. Uh, it's almost like we're back to normal. Um, and I'm so pleased to be able to be here and share this work with you today. I think um, I will just get started. In the early days of 2020, a few months before George Floyd's death, sparked kinetic uprisings across North America, my father said to me, you know, Deborah, your daughter was the first Thompson born in America since Cornelius Thompson escaped slavery in 1860. It's been over 150 years, and some days I think we came back too soon. My dad was born and spent the first years of his life in Shrewsbury, Ontario. It's a tiny town about 50 miles east of Detroit on the shores of Lake Erie. It and other neighboring towns like Buxton and Dresden were among the last stops on the Underground Railroad. In 1850, the US Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act as part of a, seri as part of a series of compromises made between the Southern enslaving states and the free Northern states. It required officials to arrest people suspected of being runaway slaves with little or no evidence, and it penalized any official who dare not comply. Anyone found aiding a runaway slave was 
subject to six months imprisonment or a thousand dollar fine. Monetary awards were offered to anyone who captured a fugitive slave. Those suspected of being runaway slaves could not testify on their own behalf, nor could they defend themselves against the accusations. The result was a program of mass kidnapping of free blacks across the United States. But the Fugitive Slave Act didn't extend to Canada, and so to Canada, thousands fled, including my grandfather's grandfather, Cornelius Thompson. Most of the people that escaped Canada went back to the US at the end of the Civil War to find the loved ones they, lost, they left behind or lost along the way or who were stolen from them somehow. The generations of those people descended from black American refugees from slavery still live in southwestern Ontario, including my father's family. Because the communities were rural and segregated, my kin have the most wonderful way of speaking, their southern intonations inflected with unambiguously Canadian accents. My father says theater and pronounces the WH in white. He talks in the same rhythmic riddles that characterize barbershop talk in African-American communities and cultures. He says things like, well, Deborah, you know that hindsight is 20-20 because any fool can turn around and look behind him. But he is also staunchly, feardly, proudly Canadian. And his accent appears plainly in words like a boat and sorry. Dad doesn't know where Cornelius escaped from. He thought that he heard someone talking about, West, or talking about Virginia or maybe Alabama once, but he's skeptical. Deborah, he says, you're looking for ghosts. You're looking for people, you're looking for evidence uh, of people who were trying to hide and whose lives depended on how well and for how long they could do it. So many of our stories are ghost stories. How could they not be? African descended people in the Americas are connected by the horrors of the Middle Passage. The point during the route of the, tra of the transatlantic slave trade when Africans were violently kidnapped from their traditional territories, commodified as objects, forcibly transported to the New World and sold as property. So too, the Atlantic holds a place in our collective memory. It is the domain of the goddess Yumaya, and there is blood in the water. It is the fathoms of the dead. When I decided to move to the US a decade ago, I thought that the ghosts of my ancestors would welcome me home. I thought that I was returning to the land of my ancestors' birth, the country they built for free, the places where they prayed and sweated and toiled and were tortured and resisted and fought, where they, where they wept as their children were stolen and sold, where they were traumatized as they were raped for profit and murdered for sport. The places they died, the places they still haunt. They escaped and I returned to lay claim to the humanity that they were refused. I thought that I was going home. And of course, I was wrong, but not in the way that you might think. I know that some of you might have come here tonight to hear about my research. I've spent the past 15 years thinking about the comparative politics of race, especially between Canada and the United States. But I've spent the past 40 years living in this body and sometimes believing everything others said about me and absorbing all the messages of only white teachers and predominantly white spaces and white protagonists in popular culture who told me that the best that I could ever be was the sidekick to someone else's story. And Black History Month for me is actually black past, present, and future every day of the week. And I think that I have some things to say. So let's begin with Du Bois. In the opening pages of The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903, the prolific African-American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois identified the so-called Negro problem as the unasked question of white America. 
They approach me in a half-hesitant sort of way, I mean curiously or compassionately, and then instead of saying directly, he writes, how does it feel to be a problem? They say, I know an excellent colored man in my town, or I fought at Mechanicsville, or do not these southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile or am interested or reduce the boiling to a simmer as the, case may, as the occasion may require. To the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I answer seldom a word. How does it feel to be a problem? My initiation to American life was in Cambridge, Massachusetts on the outskirts of Boston, the birthplace of the American Revolution. Riding the red line to Harvard Station, I watched as young black men got on the subway, laughing and joking like teenagers do. And I watched as the white people in the vicinity surreptitiously moved away and avoided eye contact with them. How does it feel to be a problem? I thought of Du Bois's question when I moved to start my first teaching position at Ohio University. For four really long years, I lived in Athens, Ohio. It's a very small, very white college town in the poorest county in the state nestled in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. On a day like any other, I was running along the Hawking River path when a pickup truck zoomed by and a man's voice screamed, hey, nigger. It wasn't the first time that had happened and it definitely wasn't the last time. But the worst was yet to come, and it would come from my liberal white colleagues, so desperate to be seen as progressive to my face, and yet so resentful and vindictive behind my back. Deb Thompson, she is so full of herself, like a bull in a china shop, not very collegial. How does it feel to be a problem? Du Bois coined the phrase double consciousness to describe the two-ness of being African-American and American at the same time. It's a conflict not of loyalty or allegiance, but one characterized by the hard truth that the core ideas of American national identity, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, were only made possible to white Americans because of the deadly and violent subjugation of black people. Double consciousness is also a description of the psychic weight, the, the mental energy of how it takes to have to weigh your own black identity, uh, of, sorry, of constantly viewing one's own black identity, experiences, behavior, and potential through the eyes of white people who probably hate and fear you. It is an exhausting tactic of black survival, defined by the necessity of being neither here nor there, yet everywhere at the same time. Americans often think of their country as exceptional. It is one of the world's oldest democracies, the birthplace of revolutionary freedom, the only remaining superpower, the last line of defense in a world defined increasingly by dictators and demagogues. But from the vantage point of African Americans who reside in what Du Bois called the black life world, the United States isn't exceptionally free or equal at all. American racism is all the more tragic, cunning, and ruinous, precisely because it exists alongside and yet in direct contradiction with the American creed, the pervasiveness of the American dream, and the homogenizing, the homogenizing power of American national identity. And to those who observe American history in the making from abroad, the US is only exceptional in terms of how utterly, unforgivingly, uncompromisingly racist it is. Now, this idea of American racial exceptionalism is quite powerful here in Canada. American racism is understood as real and morally repulsive. And in comparative terms, Canadian racism either does not exist or if it does, it is seen as being less harmful, less depraved, less entrenched, and less traumatic than the real racism that exists in the United States. Comparison is frequently, faithfully, routinely used uh, in the service of Canadian deniability. It's our national pastime, an obsession that works to both hide and enshrine racial inequalities that exist along nearly every socioeconomic indicator of Canadian life. 
the cognitive dissonance required to be righteously indignant about anti-black racism in America, but defensive when the perpetrators are the us and not the them, is itself a particularly Canadian form of racism. And speaking of Canadian racism, tell me if you've heard this one before. Where are you from? No, no. Where are you really from? For those whose presence in Canada has perhaps never been questioned, it might be hard to hear the presumption in the question's premise, the insinuation. Where are you from? Because I can see you're not one of us. Where are you from? Because you don't seem to fit in here. Where are you really from? Because my curiosity is more important than your comfort or your safety. Where are you really from? Because how long you've been here will tell me something about your place in this country. Where are you really from? Because you can't possibly be from here. When I was younger and more naive and more of an idiot, to be honest, my knee-jerk reaction was to claim belonging through longevity. I am from Canada. I used to insist. I'm fifth generation Canadian on my father's side, fourth generation Canadian on my mother's side. This is my interpretation, this is my impersonation of 20 year old me. Um, some of us, I would say, alternating between cynicism and shrill indignation. Some of us have been here for a very long time. I remember feeling at the time like it was crucial. It was so important that the questioner knew about my deep roots in Canada, as if the amount of time my family had been in this country would be able to tell people something about me, who I was, who I would be, who I could be, if they just knew that we had been here for generations, as if time itself was the marker of true Canadianness. There is, of course, a long history of black migration to Canada. It began as early as 1628. A nine-year-old boy stolen from Madagascar, who was later baptized Olivier Le Jeune, was the first black person to be bought and sold in this thing we now call Canada. Slavery in British North America was, of course, much smaller in comparison to other societies that depended on chattel slavery or plantation-based slavery, but it was still objectively horrific. There's, there's no such thing as humane slavery. It steals children from parents, punishes the enslaved for forming bonds of friendship or intimacy, extracts and exploits the labor of the unfree, and operates under the constant, relentless threat of violence and death. And yeah, slavery existed here in Canada for over 200 years. But beyond those brought to Canada against their will as the enslaved, scholars generally speak of three waves of black immigration to Canada. The first occurred in the aftermath of the American Revolution. Approximately 3,000 black people who fought for Britain during the Revolutionary War in exchange for their freedom were transported from New York to Nova Scotia, along with white British loyalists that brought enslaved people with them when they fled to Canada. The second wave of black immigration or black migration to Canada were those enslaved black Americans that escaped their bondage alongside the free blacks who feared being kidnapped into slavery after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act and escaped to Canada after slavery had been abolished in 1833. Now the records here are kind of sketchy, but estimates suggest that up to 40,000 refugees from American slavery have, may have fled to Ontario and Quebec, though only 10 to 20,000 chose to remain at the end of the Civil War. The largest and most recent wave of black immigration to Canada occurred after 1967, when the federal government amended our whites only immigration policy and implemented the point system. Now in 1971, the black population of Canada was still really small. It was around 34,000 people in the entire country. My father used to joke that if you saw another black person in Toronto in the 1970s, you were probably related to them because that's how few of us there were. 
that through immigration, the population grew to just over 500,000 of us in 1991, and today we stand at over 1.2 million people. But some of us, I would say, have been here for a very long time. I wonder now why I felt it was so important to convey that I wasn't a newcomer. What was it about me, my humanity, my potential, that the questioner would know if I could just convince them that I had roots in this country? Why would the number of generations we can trace in Canada matter at all? What does a claim to being here for a long time really mean? Well, in empirical terms, the length of time that immigrants and their descendants have spent in their adopted country actually does matter quite a bit for a host of socioeconomic indicators. Generational status is frequently used as a proxy for assimilation into dominant culture. We often assume, and a lot of data demonstrate, that over time the characteristics that define immigrant groups and host societies become more and more similar. With each generation, the descendants of immigrants are likely to adopt the host cultures, sorry, the host society's cultural norms, master the dominant language, and intermarry with different ethnic groups. The material differences between generations removed from immigration also tend to disappear over time. Canadian children and grandchildren of immigrants are typically better educated, wealthier, and have stronger feelings of attachment to Canada than those who came before them. We assume that the longer your family has been in this country, the more Canadian you become. And but these rules about the relationship between longevity and belonging don't seem to apply to black folks. There's ample evidence of persistent socioeconomic disparities that plague black communities, even long-standing ones in Halifax and sort of southwestern Ontario. According to a series of reports that StatsCan did in 2019, between 2001 and 2016, unemployment rates among the black population were higher than the rest of the population, even at high levels of education. Poverty rates were also higher, and the wage gap between black and white groups are, persist are persistent and significant. Even second-generation black Canadians, those people who were born here, report feeling lower levels of belonging to this country. More troubling still is the way that black Canadians most frequently experience Canadian democracy through our interactions with the coercive, violent, and punitive arms of the state. Numerous reports detail that black people face rampant systemic discrimination in urban centers, are disproportionately stopped, carded, charged, arrested, and subjected, subjected to use of force by police, and are overrepresented in the system of mass incarceration. That which has been called the new Jim Crow in the United States has gone largely unnoticed and therefore unresolved here in Canada. I didn't know any of this when I insisted cynically, angrily, indignantly that some of us have been here for a very long time. I didn't know that claims about longevity, generational status, and time are frequently mobilized in ideas about who belongs and who doesn't, the barriers to and the conduits of integration, and political debates about redress, reconciliation, and reparations. My younger self, the idiots, felt that it was so, so critical for others to understand that the history of this country involved my people. But really, it was about making a clear distinction between those of us who had been here for a long time and therefore belonged, and those who were new, who came from elsewhere, who shouldn't be able to make those same claims until they had generational standing like me. It's a logic that implies that foreigners should be treated differently, that even as we declare we believe in the equal moral worth of every human being, we also believe that some people are just worth more to our democracy based on the unearned privilege afforded by the march of time. It is the calculus of settler colonialism, and it is morally indefensible. For years, black Canadian scholars have talked about the absented presence of blackness in Canada. 
The absented part describes the way that black people in Canada are assumed not to exist, or if they exist, uh, to be recent arrivals to what has always been a white country. Catherine McKittrick writes that blackness in Canada is always unexpected, always surprising. Blackness is surprising, she writes, because it should not be here, was not here before, was always here, is only momentarily here, was always over there beyond Canada, for example. This means then that black people in Canada are also presumed surprises because they are not here and here simultaneously. So read this way, the question, where are you really from, is an attempt to address the shock and astonishment of seeing blackness in a place where it is not supposed to be. The question assumes the necessity of defining blackness as from elsewhere because, as, McKitt as McKittrick notes, black existence actually takes on several forms that do not always align or conform to the idea of Canada. But blackness in Canada is not just absent, it is absented. To be absented rather than just absent implicates the involvement of political processes that bring conditions into being. Our invisibility in national mythologies is neither a coincidence nor a mistake, but rather a purposeful crafting of a vision of Canada that renders black people invisible. The presence part in absented presence implicates the ways that narratives of Canadian identity depend on the existence of black Canada even as they erase it. The idea of Canada as the promised land, as the destination for fugitive slaves who followed the North Star, a safe haven from the tyranny of American racism, a contemporary multicultural paradise that demonstrates the potential of a truly multiracial democracy. These are foundational parables of the Canadian imagination, and they depend on the historical presence of an allegorical black Canada, just not too many black people of course, and certainly not angry black people or radical black people or ungrateful black people or black people who, who remember the raising of Africville and Halifax and Hogan's Alley here in Vancouver or black people who point out the ways that Canada tolerates blackness only begrudgingly. These forgettings, denials, erasures are critical to a national discourse that deliberately avoids any talk about race or racism. The rhetoric of Canadian multiculturalism was everywhere in the 1980s or and 1990s, and that was very confusing for me and my siblings as we navigated countless situations where we were the only black people in sight. Like so many black children who grow up in predominantly white spaces, I was maybe four or five when I learned from the other kids in my neighborhood that I was black and that black was ugly and stupid and unwanted. Slurworthy, slurable blackness. It's so odd now to be grown and to listen to white parents worry that their white children are too young and too innocent to learn about racism when it was the white children and the ignorance they inherited from their white parents who terrorized my childhood. Children are cruel, but at least they're direct about it. The colorblind racism of, of adults was always harder to pinpoint. What sociologist Eduardo Benilla Silva calls racism without racists, always operating under the cloud of plausible deniability. Multiculturalism was an integral part of Canada's national identity, but I could tell you stories for days about how little multiculturalism did to help me deal with either structural or individualized racism, or the many subtle messages I got that I was never quite good enough how I was skipped over for promotions when I was a teenager at my part-time job at McDonald's, no joke, because I had a problem with authority. The security guards that used to follow me around department stores, the buses that would pass me by if I was the only one standing at the stop, the fact that I couldn't find a foundation to match my skin tone until the year of our Lord 2005, 
And I could tell you, and I could write an entire book on the trauma of white people trying to cut my hair. I couldn't name these experiences as racism because of Canadian multiculturalism, which encases the crucible of racial gaslighting. The gaslighting isn't just that others insist that they just don't see race. The true damage of the psychological manipulation is, that, is the insinuation that the racism I know I have experienced must not have really happened, or it must not have happened that way, or it must have been some misunderstanding, or I'm sure he was just joking, Deborah. Are you sure you're not being too sensitive and misinterpreting things? Nothing and everything and nothing is about race. Canadians also avoid discussions of race or racism through a strategy of relational denial. The US looms large in Canadians' imagination. America's foundational ideas, beliefs, identities, narratives, obsessions, psychoses, these all have an enormous influence on the formation of Canadian national identity. It's hard to share a border, language, ideological tradition, media, and pop culture with the world's only superpower. At least in Anglophone Canada, being Canadian is very much defined as being not American. In the Canadian popular imaginary, the United States is kind of like the mean girl in high school. The United States is basically our very own Regina George. We hate her, but we love her. And she's terrible, but sometimes she's not terrible to us, but she's frequently terrible to other people. But really, why won't she just pay attention to us? It hurts our feelings that she doesn't think we're cool. There's a racial logic embedded in the way that we differentiate ourselves from Americans. America is racist. Canada is not America. So Canada cannot possibly be racist. But I think there is an innate value to the exploration of blackness, belonging, and the broader politics of race in Canada and the US, not necessarily in contrast, but rather in relation to one another. Ideas and inspirations, people and prophets, goods and grievances have crossed the border for centuries. Black freedom dreams, as well, have never been bound by national borders. And while others have compared the US to more obvious circumstances of legalized racial apartheid, like Nazi Germany or apartheid South Africa, the insistence in Canada that racism happens somewhere else or happened a long time ago requires a kind of national ignorance, what the poet Dion Brand calls a stupefying innocence that is worthy of careful examination. Extreme cases have a lot to tell us, but so too do unsuspecting ones, and Canadian peculiarities make for interesting politics. As I've already implied, black communities in Canada are both very old, predating Confederation by centuries, and very new, growing only exponentially in the mid to late 1990s. The population is quite small at 3.5% of the national pop population, but significant in cities like Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, and Ottawa. We are the diaspora of the diaspora, so to speak. Both old and new black communities are the products of global collusions and imperial collisions of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. But we black Canadians have neither the level of political or cultural recognition of African Americans, nor the sheer magnitude of the millions that comprise the black population in the Caribbean and South America. We also have a unique kind of racial consciousness here in Canada, the result of multiple formations of blackness that are crisscrossed with nationality, ethnicity, generational status, language, class, religious, and more, but which are also shaped by convergences, amalgamations, frictions, translations, and intersections with shifting contours of Canadian society. Organizing and creating solidarity even within black communities in Canada can be a challenge, but it's also full of the potential that comes with the recognition of multiple, overlapping, authentically contradictory black experiences. 
Blackness in Canada also exists within the crucible of Canadian exceptionalism. That is to say, Canada the exceptional, Canada the clearly not racist, Canada the good, Canada the white savior, Canada the successful multicultural experiment. The dismissiveness is part of the appeal because if we in Canada are the exception to the racial rule, then we have no need to examine our exceptionally Canadian racial rules. It's a red herring, of course, because Canadian racism is shaped not just by a global history that gives it this familiar force and feeling, but also by those specificities that make it Canadian born and bred, just like me. So it's an open question about how Canadian racism is shaped by Canadian democracy, Canadian political structures, Canadian liberalism, Canadian whiteness, Canadian politeness, Canadian public policy, Canadian political parties, Canadian political culture, Canadian popular culture, Canadian urban centers, Canadian regionalism, Canadian ruralism, Canadian media, Canadian peacekeeping, Canadian war making, Canadian bilingualism, Canadian settler colonialism, and the Canadian national inferiority complex. There's a lot we don't know about the nuances of anti-black racism here in Canada. It's hard to research what is so consistently jettisoned to the realm of the unthinkable. That's part of the reason why a sense of real belonging was, at least for me, always kind of elusive here in Canada. The kind of belonging I always wanted in the country of my birth, I instead sought out in the country that enslaved my ancestors. But the idea of home is complicated. It's more, of course, it's more than just a physical location. It's not just about where you land or where you live. It's also about membership in a community, the people that you claim as your own and those who claim you in return. In 2015, I moved to the great black metropolis, Chicago. It was around the same time that Black Lives Matter emerged, challenging rampant, endemic police violence in cities across America. I started learning about the criminal punishment system and found horrors at every turn. Police killings that are underreported by more than half. The obscene militarization of law enforcement agencies everywhere civil forfeitures that allow the police to seize and then keep or sell cash and property that they allege is involved in a crime, like pirates. Police oversight boards that are basically comprised of former cops, overworked and underpaid public defendants, sorry, public defenders with mere minutes to spend preparing for each case. Mostly white prosecutors who overcharge defendants in order to coerce plea deals the racialized legacy of the war on drugs, mandatory minimum sentences, and three strikes laws that incarcerate nonviolent offenders for decades, the cash bail system, administrative fines and fees that target and imprison poor people for being poor, preemptory strikes that all but guarantee that black defendants are tried by all white juries, the barriers to prisoner reentry when the label felon can be used to deny access to public housing, private rental markets, food stamps, jobs, professional licenses, travel, and more. The fact that we as a society think that it is appropriate to put human beings in cages. We condemn ourselves with our complicity of these cruelties. Abolition is truly the only way forward. I didn't used to think this way. Young Deb never dreamed of this. My students made this radical turn possible. You cannot be a decent teacher without a reservoir for hope about what the future holds and about who will bring it into being. Police and prison abolition is just a single star in a constellation of black radical politics that asks us to imagine a different kind of reality. We rage for the calamity of the present because we know, we dream, we believe that the world can be better than it is now. 
The central lessons I teach my students are not about the ways that the police work to hasten black death, but rather about the forces that have ensured resilience and the perseverance of black life. But America could never be all that I wanted it to be. I was still an immigrant, an interloper. I could always pass as American born. I got rid of my Canadian accent as soon as I could because my students were making fun of me. And to a certain extent, I was always welcomed in black communities wherever I was, but I was still a non-citizen. I was able to conceal my status as an immigrant, not just because I got rid of my accent, but more importantly, because I am not what most people think of when they think of an immigrant to the United States. Even as the vast majority, 77% to be precise, of the more than 40 million foreign-born people in America are lawful immigrants, it is the 10 million unauthorized immigrants and more specifically, the 8.1 million people, live, uh, million unauthorized immigrants uh, from Latin America that tend to capture the public's imagination and shape the terms of the political debate. Unnoticed are the 100,000 Canadians that constituted the largest nationality of visa overstays in 2019, and the fact that Canadians and Europeans combined represent nearly half of all US immigration violations, though we, of course, are rarely detained or charged. As migrant justice activist Harsha Walia argues, the so-called migrant crisis is politically contrived. Mass migration is the outcome of multiple intersecting global crises, including exploitative relationships within a global capitalist system, unequal power relations of economic and political conquest between the global north and the global south, and the disastrous and worsening effects of climate change. But the political distortion of a migrant crisis positions Western nations as the victims of unwanted, unauthorized, unrelenting migration, even as our settler colonial countries were founded by millions of Europeans who were also unwanted, unauthorized, and unrelenting in their efforts to commit to the destruction of indigenous peoples and the outright theft of indigenous lands. The Red Nation Coalition for Indigenous Liberation writes, no one is illegal on, on stolen land except those who stole it. The last few years I spent in the United States, I lived in Oregon. And for three years, I lived uh, with my partner and our two children in Kalapuya Ilahi, a residence hall at the University of Oregon. My colleagues thought I was ridiculous. The exact words they used were insane to uh, live on campus among freshmen. But Kalapuya Ilahi means the homeland of the Kalapuya people. And it meant something, at least to me, to continue this decade-long struggle with the idea of home alongside people who were away from, young people who were away from home for the first time who were looking to forge new connections on the traditional territory of those who had been there since time immemorial and who were forcibly displaced from their homes, now our homes, only through the legacy of theft, coercion, deceit, and death. It seemed important, at least to me, to contend with and against ideas of home in the discomfort of this unearned inheritance as an immigrant, as a foreigner, as a descendant of stolen people who were exploited on stolen land, to think about what kind of community we could build with these young people, just beginning to learn more about the world around them. It was insane, and it was an honor. While slavery is often cast as America's original sin, the country, of course, was simultaneously founded on indigenous genocide and dispossession. The common thread between the two is the way that both land and people were turned into property. 
These entanglements are not uncomplicated. Some indigenous nations enslaved black people long after the end of the Civil War. And black Americans uh, who were formerly enslaved joined the US Army as Buffalo soldiers and were responsible for the genocide of indigenous people. And always, always, the agents and representatives of the US government pitted one group against the other to erode indigenous sovereignty and exploit black labor. Still, being reflexive about black politics requires facing realities of settler colonialism in North America. Black people may not quite be settlers, but instead are, as Jody Bird has argued, arrivants. It's a term that recognizes that we did not necessarily come here by choice, but yet are complicit in and benefit from settler colonialism as a violent continuing structure that erases indigenous sovereignty and people at times precisely because our search for home and inclusion imagines this territory and nation as belonging unproblematically to us. A reflexive black politics requires that we think about what it means to be in a particular space, to take up space, to honor space, to make a space into a home. To think of land not as something we possess, but rather the ways that ideas of property ownership are tied up with beliefs, sometimes enshrined in law, about who could own property, who could be dispossessed of their property, and who could be bought and sold as property. That the idea of possessing and being possessed means we are all haunted by that which was supposed to have been destroyed, displaced long ago, but is actually still here in the room with us. To recognize that black freedom can never, will never be won through indigenous displacement. I moved back to Canada in the summer of 2020, barely a month after George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis sparked kinetic uprisings in cities across North America, when a lot of white people who had never been asked where they were really from, who had never been betrayed by the honor of the crown, and who had perhaps never questioned the nature of our democracy began to wonder a few things. And they began to wonder why it is our democracy demands such extraordinary sacrifice from those citizens who are already lacking in power and resources, who are already, sorry, who are arguably in the worst possible position to make those sacrifices. At what point does it become unjust, unethical, or even undemocratic? to expect black and indigenous people to abide by the terms of a social contract that seems myopically intent on our destruction through force or neglect. They began to wonder, as the prolific black essayist James Baldwin once did, whether inclusion is worth the price of the ticket. What good is inclusion into an unequivocally unequal society? And as Dr. King is once purportedly said, why on earth would I want to be integrated into a burning house? I came back to Canada during this particular moment. Some called it a racial reckoning, hearkened and accentuated by death, substantiated through struggle, haunted by the conceptual space between what was imaginable and what was possible. We didn't know then what had come crashing into the public sphere full of chaos and passion, fire and fury, later predictably dilution and corporate co-optation. Even now, years removed from the uprisings, there isn't a coherent narrative that can explain why the world stopped to protest, to grieve, to rage, to rebel together. Reckoning, I think, might not be the right word for all that has happened between then and now. The idea of a reckoning is about honored promises, debts repaid, and a balance restored. 
not unlike that problematic but often said concept of reconciliation. To reckon can also be used to express dreams and expectations, just as readily as a reckoning faces the past again and again, like the way that a return home involves circling back to the beginning of a decade-long decade journey. What is clear to me is that the moment we were once in has now passed. The moment we're in now is much less clearly defined, much more indeterminate. It's a moment when old horizons have collapsed or evaporated and new ones have not yet taken shape, in the words of David Scott. We are in a time of speculation and flux, vulnerability and risk, incoherence and possibility. And so take heed. We might not like what emerges on the other side of this moment. Racial progress has always, always been shadowed by a disproportionate white backlash. But nothing, nothing would have changed. Nothing would have happened had black people not taken to the streets. As the great orator and abolitionist Frederick Douglass once said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And at what is the beginning, not the middle, and certainly not the end of this iteration of racial backlash, the very least we can do is remember and try to make sense of all that was and all that still might be. Truth be known, using my experiences as an entry point to this broader inquiry about the politics of race and blackness and belonging makes me deeply uncomfortable. But in black studies, storytelling is tradition, repetition is sacred, and writing is the process of turning bewilderment into awe. Black studies as vocation isn't just interdisciplinary, but anti-disciplinary and undisciplinary in that we seek the knowledge through which we will achieve racial justice in this world, or we will remake it so those that follow will. This is not a story about racism. This is a story about life, impossible life, improbable life. We live here together in the impossible. We can struggle towards other impossible things because the abolition of slavery was once an impossible thing. We struggle together with other impossible people. No one is illegal. No one is illegal on stolen land, land back. Wherever we are is whenever we are. We rise, we fall, we bleed, we pray, we fight, we grieve, we disagree, we celebrate, we remember together. The truest thing about travel and movement and journeys, as anyone who has ever gone anywhere knows, is how people change as they move. Our identities and our understandings of home are not fixed. Belonging is never once and for all. So too, the idea of a return is the stuff of fairy tales. Going back to a place where we once were but no longer are and yet desire to be, it is a futility of the highest order. You can't go home again, not because home changes, but because you do. Thank you.
So I'm going to go back and forth. Uh, and the flow is Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was awesome. Um, I brought my 13-year-old daughter, and initially I was like, I don't know if 13 is too young, but I love how you mentioned that it is children. And a big part of what I brought her for was she obviously has been you know, voicing a lot of that angst. And so thank you for putting a lot of words to that, and I think that's going to really enrich her vocabulary, and even more so help her understand her own feelings as she's navigating all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, and I'm so I'm so glad you're here. Um, I hope that you are able to learn more at 13 than I knew. The internet has opened up possibilities of building community wherever we are. It's incredible. Um, yeah, thank you so much. We have a question from the Zoom audience. Yes, please. Yeah, right. So uh, Deborah, there's a question from someone called Sasha, who says, how might I be able to both recognize and combat the micro-racist behaviors I commit? I get so scared of treating someone in a different or racist way that it's noticeable I feel awkward and that I don't know what to do. Yeah, that, that is honest. Someone just said that's honest. Yeah, that's thank you. Thanks for being honest, Sasha. That's that uh, we really appreciate that. Um, look, uh, we all make mistakes. You know, like like this is one of the things I I always want to impart upon my audiences is I want you to know um, that I. Never had a black teacher. The only black teacher I laid eyes on was my father. I never had a black professor in 10 years of post-secondary education. I didn't know anything about black studies until I was 30 years old and moved to the US. Uh, I learned this. You know? And, and, I, I, and I, in, in the presentation, I talk about how I used to think in order to demonstrate that my thinking has evolved, right? Like these things are learnable. These things are, are teachable, right? And we're bound to make mistakes and that's, that's okay, right? Mistakes, mistakes are fine. Um, what you do is you apologize and then you try to do better. Um, and you work on educating yourself because one of the, the challenges of being a person of color and a black person is we frequently get asked to educate others about these issues. And it is not, in, in the age of Google, it is not our job to teach white people about race, except me. It is actually literally my job <laughs> to teach white people about race. Um, but like, you know, just, just keep, keep reading, try to find ways to, to educate yourself. Um, and um, one of the things that has certainly helped me uh, learn more about groups that I'm unfamiliar with has been finding friends, <laughs> you know, make sure your, your friend group is diverse will certainly change your perspective on a lot of things. Um, and yeah, I wish you the best of luck. I think that's a great question, and it's very honest, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, my, uh, thank you also for writing that book on census, <laughs> because I have also been working on the issue of who is defining the, dif the race in the United States and Canada, because uh, I think in Canada there's a black, white, and nine categories of Asians, yeah. and in, in USA it's similar. But my question is not, because I still have to write up comments on our book. My question is about the representation of African-American and Asians as well. 
that uh, we have had a debate around the issue of what was the impact of Obama, or now we have recently had Whoopi Goldberg raising the issue of race. And also we have Defense Secretary, Minister of Defense here is in South Asian, in states it's, uh, it's an African American. So I wonder what is the impact because now the Buffalo soldiers are, are, are not different in terms of color and or in terms of the role it plays to, especially I'm doing work with grandparents and grandchildren and I find grandchildren are now confused about the whole issue of race. Thank you. Thanks. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Sure, I get your question. Are you are you asking about kind of like the representation of, of black folks and people of color in, in positions of power? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Masks make things a little difficult. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. They're necessary. Um, this is a really great question. Um, in part because descriptive representation is um, it it means something. It is important, you know. I just, I just, I just said I never had a black teacher, right? I never had a black professor. Like that, it does something to your mind. Does something to what you view as possible as a, a child and adolescent and young person when you never see anyone who's in a position of power who looks like you. Like it, do, it does something. Representation is absolutely important, um, and yet. And yet, we know, especially um, if we're thinking about things like police violence, that uh, black faces in high places have done very little. Example, uh, you know, after Black Lives Matter emerged with the, uh, the murder, the in custody murder of, of Freddie Gray in Baltimore. And the DOJ, you know, there's a consent decree and the DOJ did an investigation into the Baltimore Police Department, which, you know, had a, a lot of black officers. Uh, Marilyn Mosby was the attorney general. She laid charges against the officers involved in Freddie Gray's death. None of them, none of them stuck. Like two ended in mistrial and, um, you know, was, nobody went to jail for this young man's death when his, his, his spine was 95% severed from his body, right? Um, and so like we, even as descriptive representation is important symbolically, it can even be important um, substantially, substantively, right? Because black voices and the voices of other people of color bring perspectives that maybe all white committees never would have thought of. And that is, that's crucial, right? Um, but it certainly is not everything. Um, and what we actually need, we, we cannot try to think of like individualistic solutions to what is an issue of systemic structural racism. Um, Obama, Obama did not solve any of our problems, in fact, um, you know, there's, there's good research uh, from Melanie Price and Fred Harris uh, demonstrating that Obama as the first black president, yes, really important symbol. Was Obama good for black people? Like empirically, like no, <laughs> no, he, he wasn't actually. Uh, and uh, Michael Tesler's work as well demonstrates that everything that Obama touched, uh, Republicans immediately, jumped on as, uh, as being, as, as having that, those files being racialized, if that makes sense. So, you know, the Obamacare Act was, was immediately about race. Right? Anything Obama touched was about race because that's how Republicans were framing it. So that was a long winded answer to say that representation is important. We should value it, but it will not solve all of our problems. Uh, individual solutions cannot undo structural issues.
Uh, like, so, so I do this exercise with my students. I teach a class on, on Black Lives Matter. I do this exercise with my students uh, where we take an entire whiteboard and we talk about all the components of the criminal punishment system. I know you, some people call it the criminal justice system, but there's very little justice being done. So the criminal punishment system. And we start with like policing on one end, we have kind of incarceration on the other end, and we have like the black box of prosecution and courts in the middle. And we start listing like the elements of the criminal punishment system that are either explicitly targeted um, to incarcerate black people, right? Like the mandatory minimums, three strike laws, racialized war on drugs, that kind of stuff. Um, or the potential, has the potential for bias, um, like policing, of course. Um, or those laws and policies which, um, you know, seem seem like they they may be universal or neutral, and yet are, are consistently enacted in a biased way. And by the time we're done this exercise, like the board is is full, right? The board is full, um, and everything from carding, stop and frisk, three strikes laws, cash bail, all the way over to you know the the intake exams that uh, Tom Cardarso has shown. Uh, are biased against um, indigenous people and, and black people, which limits their chance of parole, um, the, you know, the entire system of private prisons and uh, the, the parole system. Uh, anyway, we, we list all of it, all of it. And this is what we mean by a system, right? A system of moving parts, hundreds, thousands, of intersecting, overlapping policies, jurisprudence, norms, laws, right, discretionary action that all supports, right, the system of structural racism. And so when people talk about, for example, like defunding the police, like, yeah, we should defund the police. Yes, yes. But is that going, that will be pulling a thread in a big system, all of which is saturated, saturated with racism. So to get to the question that um, the person on Zoom asked, like, it is not up to you to, you know, to solve like this giant structural problem. Giant structural problems cannot be solved with individual action. They can be solved with collective action, right? And I know it seems, it feels overwhelming. And if you are a black person, it is exhausting, I know. But the thing I want you all to, to know as well is that, you know, these impossible things like are not, right? Like in, in 1860, White Southerner, white Southern slaveholders could not imagine an economy without enslaved black people. They could not imagine it, right? In fact, after the end of the Civil War, they, they created a new system that was basically enslaved black people through sharecropping, right? And yet, we, it moved on, right? Slavery was abolished. Right? So these impossible things, if you think about systemic racism as being too big, right, too big to, to dismantle, we have dismantled systems before. It takes incredible collective action. Um, it takes a lot of work. And it's not on just one person. Um, I think we can do it again. Hi. 
Uh, great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, my question is actually a pretty good follow-up to uh, the last one because uh, it looks at uh, sort of deals with a systemic view of, of the problem. Uh, so, what is uh, what are your thoughts on the assertion that uh, black people can never really expect to achieve equality, uh, true equality, within the confines of a capitalist system. Um, capitalism essentially uh, uh, crushes comradeship, right? Like it views, it, it encourages you to view the person next to you as a competitor all the time. And that's especially easy when um, the person doesn't look like you. So, um, you know, and these, these policies have been around for centuries. They were imported from, from the British Caribbean, uh, which is actually where I ancestrally uh, hail from. Uh, and, and really what they do is that uh, it's, a, it's a means of rich white people uh, stoking up racism between poor white people and black people as a means of maintaining socioeconomic control over both. And, uh, and those policies have been massively successful uh, for centuries. So should we not really be looking at creating a more progressive, uh, dare I say, socialist um, society in tandem with the push for racial equality, because I feel like one might need to come first <laughs> before the other. Um, and I should probably add that before, you know, everyone freaks out uh, from the, the S word, the, the socialist word, um, there, there's never been a society that has a, truly aspired to the um, uh, the goals of Marx and Engels. Uh, so communist China, Soviet Union, those are not examples of, of truly socialist societies. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my point really is that um, I think more progressive, more, more socialist uh, um, policies mm -hmm. may need to filter into our political system and our social system, or our economic system, socioeconomic system, in order for racial equality to actually um, come to pass. What were your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a great question. There's a lot in there. Yeah, sorry. No, no, it's cool. No, it's cool. There's a lot in there. Um, how do I want to start this? Do, 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 do. So, it is, of course, no coincidence that the modern conception of race emerged at the same time as modern capitalist formations, um, and also emerged at the same time as the nation state. These, like these, these big world historical projects are all connected in ways um, such that there are scholars who argue that you know, we, you can't just talk about capitalism. It's always been a racial capitalism, right? It's always been. Um, capitalism premised on the exploitation um, of the proletariat and, and enslaved people and like the capitalistic uh, efforts have always been coded by, by race. Um, and you are right in that um, the greatest fear kind of emerging in many uh, slaveholding societies was a broad coalitional politics between enslaved Africans or in people of African descent and poor whites, right? And you see this time and time again in the U.S., like uh, John Turner, you know, Bacon's Rebellion. And a every time after the Haitian Revolution, every time there are, there's, there's a potential for these class-based, you know, cross-racial, interracial uprisings, what has happened is the state or the colonial authority has, like, stepped in and, like, um, employed race as a wedge, right? Um, du Bois called it like the, the, the wages of whiteness, right? Um, it, we see 
uh, more racialized policies, more, more laws around race, more definitions of who is white, precisely at those moments of potential allyship and collaboration. So that's totally right. As for uh, the other, the, the, your points about socialism, I mean like, yeah, yes. Um, so interestingly, so Keith Banting and I wrote an article, uh, it took us six years to write this article, but it, it was published recently in the Canadian Journal of Political Science. And we essentially asked the question of, you know, why is it that Canada has all of these policies with egalitarian undertones, right? We have uh, this race neutral immigration system uh, that prioritizes economic migrants. We have multiculturalism. We have constitutional anti-discrimination provisions. Uh, we have a welfare state, uh, including single payer healthcare. Why is it that we have these egalitarian-ish policies and yet we still have pervasive racial inequality. Like why haven't these policies worked to alleviate racial inequality? Um, and our answer is twofold. One is that all of our policies, these egalitarian policies were put in place in like the 1960s and 70s when Canada was very white, you know, like Canada, if you look at the 1981 census, Canada is like 97% white, right? It's a super white country. Um, and so the policies, including multiculturalism, were largely designed by and for a white electorate. The more interesting question we argue is like, why is it as Canada gets more racially diverse in the 90s and racial economic inequality becomes more apparent, why are none of the policy tools that we have like reconfigured to better address racial inequality? And the argument we come up with is that underlying all Canadian policies is this universalist thrust. Right, and what that means is that Canadian policies are premised on like a kind of universalism, like an idea that like if we, we, we shall lift all boats together, right? Um, and so immigrants and the policies have always been really, really hesitant to conceptualize or to redress racial economic inequality specifically. So that means that we have a lot of policies that like target the middle class as a universal category that catches, you know, all people in theory, but we don't have a lot of policies that specifically are aimed at helping like black and indigenous, like poor people, you know, low income people. Um, we have policies around immigrant integration, right? But we don't have a lot of policies that are dealing with the rampant labor market discrimination uh, often promoted by professional associations who refuse to recognize foreign credentials, right? And so my, the, point, the, the, the point of the story is that like my sense is that we will not, we cannot solve a problem of a, of a hierarchy by creating policies that simply move everyone in the hierarchy, let, leave the hierarchy intact as we move everyone up different levels of, of socioeconomic status. Um, we'll still end up with this like racially stratified economy. Um, even as a racially stratified economy, you know, any economist will tell you is like, it's not the, the best way, it's not the best way to run an economy, obviously, right? Like having segregation is bad for the economy. You want people to actually like be able to use their skills, best skilled for the best job. Um, so my sense is that the, the most effective way of dealing with this is, is like, targeted, like targeted positive action, which we have never actually tried in this country because our, our, our affirmative action policy, which is called employment equity because we don't like the language of affirmative action here in Canada because it's too American, um, it has no teeth. Right, it has no teeth. It has no, there's no, there's very few penalties for not following it. Uh, it's, it's undergoing a review right now, actually. My colleague Adele Blackett is, is, is leading the review of employment equity. Um, and until policies like that you know, work better, uh, I think that we are going to see like, very similar outcomes. And it's not impossible. You know, like the, I get in trouble for saying this in Quebec, but like, it's not impossible 
to use policy to change socioeconomic status. It can be done. It has been done. The Official Languages Act truly changed the status, uh, the wealth status of French Canadians in a generation, right? That, that very prominent uh, disadvantage that French Canadians had coming out of the Quiet Revolution in economic terms after the passage of the, of the Official Languages Act, it, it turned around in a generation, though that gap disappeared through targeted positive action. It has been done before, right? We just haven't ever actually experimented with a tool that, that has like the, the, the teeth like the, to, to make it work properly. Thanks for that question though. It was very complicated. I think I gave a less complicated answer. I think we have time for one more question. So there are, uh, no, we happen to know that we're flooded with questions on Zoom. Oh. Uh, if there is one thing common to all of them is that everybody thanks you for a riveting talk and they feel honored and happy and connected. Oh. Which I think the whole thing makes you very happy to hear. That does make me happy. That is a great question. That is a great question. And actually, um, to give a, a pretty short answer, back when Black Lives Matter uh, was, was kind of new, uh, I feel like it was like 2015, 2016, um, there, I can't remember if they were an actual organization or just a group of people, but a number of uh, young Asian Americans produced a video in which, uh, and they recorded it in a number of different, different languages, and it was in the form of an open letter to, to their parents and their grandparents, like explaining like anti-black racism to them from like, like the cultural perspective of, you know, like the, the letters is quite, is quite heartwarming. You know, it's like these young people who are saying, I know you came here for opportunity. I know you worked hard. You know, I, 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 I understand all of these. I understand where you're coming from. And yet here's the reality of anti-black racism. Um, and so that, that learning, that like cultural acknowledgement of what was necessary was being done within communities, um, given the peculiarities of, of those communities. And that's like, you know, that's kind of what we mean when we say things like, come get your people, right? Like, because if you are in a community and you understand it well, you are positioned, you are in a great position to be able to understand the, the barriers you know, the barriers to understanding, the barriers to allyship, which can be broken down because again, we have done this before. Um, so yeah, so I, that, that's, I would recommend, um, I, I, think, I feel like it's called like an Asian American letter to our parents. If you Google it, it should show up. It's really quite beautiful. And like those kind of initiatives seem to me to be the, the way to go about gaining allyship and like look like last thing i'll say is like we need we need allies right like black led movements have always had allies there have always been race traitors there have always been white abolitionists and anti-colonials and folks who fought against apartheid in south africa people who were beneficiaries of the racial contract, but not signatories to it. You know, like mass coalitional politics, mass collective action, I think is, is the way, the best way to do this. Thank you so much for giving us a wonderful opportunity to, to listen and to learn with you tonight. Thank you. And um, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming and everybody who has made this event possible. Uh, and let me close by drawing your attention to two upcoming events. Um, 
um, from and by the history department on March, Thursday, March 3rd at 11.30 a.m. Uh, on the Burnaby campus, the um, SFU Department of History colloquium series in partnership with the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center will present uh, a talk by our colleague, Lauren Rossi, titled The Historian and the Survivor, Notes on a Collaborative Writing Project. And on Thursday, April 14th at 6.30 p.m. here um, at Harbor Center, we will have um, the third and last talk in, in our series, Highlighting Black Histories. And our guest will be Carolyn Shenasosain from UFT Scarborough, and she will talk about Canada's Hidden Figures, the story of black women cooperators. Join us again. Uh, don't be strangers. We are looking forward uh, to being with you soon. Bye-bye.